Profesor Tariq Ramadan Yang Berhormat Tato Manso Othman Dr. Ahmad Farouk Musa Respected Members of the Penang State Government and Penang State Legislature Esteemed Members of the Board of Directors of the Penang Institute and distinguished guests and friends of the Penang Institute. Good afternoon and welcome to the third Penang in Asia lecture. We are greatly honored to have Professor Tariq Ramadan talk to us on the topic of Islam, democracy and human rights. I want to state at the very start that Penang Institute is not responsible for our good fortune of bringing Professor Ramadan here. The visit of Professor Ramadan is the hard work. How's the sound? Did they test out the system? Okay. The visit of Professor Darik Ramadan is the hard work of Dr. Ahmad Farouk Musa, the founding director and chairman of the Islamic Renaissance Foundation. I suggest, yes, thank you. We owe a big thanks to the lawyer son of Penang, Dr. Farouk. Thank you for your contribution to your home state. For many years, the words Islam, democracy, and human rights rarely share the same sentence unless it is in a negative context. It is common in some circles to wrongly associate Islam with dogmatism, incompatibility with modern life, and a readiness to use violence to establish a theocracy. That myth has now been shuttled. The events in the Middle East in the last year and a half has been politically transformational. Long ruling and once untouchable dictators in Tunisia, Egypt and Libya have been overthrown by popular uprisings. The immediate concern of a large part of the world was whether these three countries would follow the path of Turkey or the path of Iran. Moving boldly forward towards modernity, universality, and an unknowable future, or moving sure-footedly back towards the emotionally comforting familiarity of a golden past. Today, Mohammed Morsi, a member of the Islamist movement, Muslim Brotherhood, has been sworn in as the first democratically elected president of Egypt. I would like to add, of course, that we have the grandson of the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood here with us today. Welcome. But back to the point, let me not uh, stand in his reflected glory. Back to the point, Mr. Morsi, upon taking office, began his president, presidency not by talking about the return to the caliphate, implementing laws of long ago, or of locking women up at home, but he called upon the restoration of parliament and the establishment of a democratic, civil, and modern state that guarantees the freedom of religion and the right to peaceful protest. A right that we are trying to peacefully persuade the Malaysian government to allow us to exercise more fully. Mr. Morsi has also promised to appoint a woman and a Coptic Christian as his two wise presidents. Mr. Morsi's actions have proved that not only does the Islamist movement not have a problem with democracy, 
It even encourages it. I know that Professor Ramadan has stated on many occasions that being Islamic is really about promoting justice, equality, and ethical behavior. And these are, in turn, universal ideals that are not confined to the Islamic faith, but to all of humanity. As Professor Ramadan himself once said, rights are rights, and to demand them is a right. In other words, there is now clear convergence to democratic principles in the major civilizations. Hinduism has already proved itself since 1947 to be compatible with the practice of liberal democracy. A part of China, Taiwan, has succeeded in peaceful transition to liberal democracy. And the Prime Minister of China, Wen Jiabao, has expressed on a number of occasions his personal support for a full transition to democratic rule on the mainland. If China, if the Communist Party of China can indeed manage the transition to a full democracy in a manner that's more efficient than what the Kuomintang has done, historians in the future will regard this successful transition the true final victory of the Communist Party over the Kuomintang. The message in Tario Square, Tiananmen Square, and Tataran Medeka is clear. All people in the world reject injustice and they want free and fair elections. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that today is very significant for two, at least two reasons. The first reason is that we are breaking the stereotype that frames Muslim as anti-democratic and anti-human rights. The second reason for why today's lecture is significant is because it is a public acknowledgement of the vibrant, progressive legacy of Penang. Penang began as a melting pot of multiculturalism. Anyone from anywhere in the world who seeks a better life for her family is welcomed with open arms. Rebellious activists and reformist philosophers who found no space in their own lands were quick to make Penang their home. Sun Yat-sen lived on Tatokramat Road, organized his party in Armenian Street, and published his newspaper along McLeister Road. Naturally, the well-known Muslim reformer, Syed Sheikh Al-Hadi from Malacca, also chose to make Penang his home. At one point, Penang housed the largest number of publishers in the country and was the base of radical publications and contrarian views. Some would argue that such a spirit still prevails today, which might be the reason why every one of the chief ministers of Penang has not departed on his own volition. Old Penang was not only a center of trade, but also a center of engagement in dialogue. In short, Old Penang was a center of civilization. And the Penang Institute wants to fulfill the aspirations of the Penang taxpayers to revive and strengthen its intellectual tradition of informed debate. In this context, we can view today's dialogue between civilizations as Penang's continued effort to reclaim its historic place in Asia and the world.